Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Me and Aislinn believe that the definition of what it means to be a woman has been shaped historically by male-dominated societies. We believe that monogamy exists as a key tenant of that oppressive definition. And until that definition expands to incorporate multiple views of how you can access your sexuality and what your as a woman in society is, we believe that full gender emancipation is impossible. In this speech, I want to lay out from opening government what our criteria is for what full gender emancipation looks like. I then want to give you two broad reasons to believe that we cannot arrive at that with the conception of monogamy as a dominant norm. So, what do we believe that full gender emancipation looks like? We believe that we're talking about legal rights for women, but we think the majority of this debate will likely occur in the realm of social perceptions of women and social norms around women, and there's two broad ones that we're particularly concerned about. The first concerns the purpose of women and the end goals that women can legitimately strive for. We think that in a society with full gender emancipation, simply by virtue of being a woman, you will not have preconceived notions of what your role in society is and what your purpose in society is foisted upon you. That's one key tenet of what a society with full gender emancipation looks like. The second key tenet of what full gender emancipation and how it manifests itself in a society involves women's sexuality. We do not think they would have particular conceptions of what a appropriate sexual behavior for women is and how they ought to access their sexuality in a truly free and equal society. We think that monogamy plays against both of those tenets, and I'm going to show you that through the lens of two arguments. Just before going there, I think we have to clarify one more thing. That by saying we oppose monogamy as a dominant social norm is not to say we support, support the imposition of new dominant social norms. We support the idea of a society where multiple conceptions of how you can access your sexuality and multiple conceptions of what your own society can be and that would be the most inclusive and fair and equal society and monogamy precludes that. Let's talk about how monogamy constrains women in terms of their ability uh, to access the purpose in their lives they would like to. The first thing we would posit to you for opening government is that the current expectation around women that is placed on monogamy is that at some point in their lives, they should settle down with one person, have children, and start a family. Recognize that this particular expectation in a world of monogamy is disproportionately placed on women insofar as it is much more socially acceptable for an older man to be a bachelor and single than it is for an older woman to be single and unmarried. The consequence of that is the existence of these dominant social norms when you see that everyone else in society is behaving a certain way, when media tells you that this is how you ought to act is that women enter into marriages and relationships where they may not otherwise have chosen to do so. Either because the state explicitly incentivizes these kinds of relationships, or they don't want to be ostracized by their community and their society for still <laughs> being single. As a consequence of entering into these kinds of relationships, we think there are a number of harms that are caused to lots of women in terms of their ability to shape their definition, no thank you Taylor, of what their purpose in society is. The first is, I think they're forced to accept conceptions of what a woman's role and a man's role in a relationship is. Insofar as we continue to see in society the idea that a woman has a unique and special obligation to stay at home and take care of children, I think that the kinds of access to life opportunities that women have by virtue of a monogamous society is reduced severely. We're not going to say this is still as it was in the 18th century where you had to literally spend all your time at home, but we think in more subtle ways it continues to manifest itself in ways that harm women. For example, the fact that even if you think under a society with monogamy, women can access the workforce, the fact that they have an additional obligation placed on them to both work and take care of children imposes a tremendous amount of obligation and demands a lot more of women than is demanded of men. That works against a society with true gender emancipation. No, thank you. The second thing is, insofar as many women are forced into relationships where having children is an expectation culturally, I think it means that they're often deprived of opportunities in the workforce, deprived of the fact that ma many employers will see women as a potential liability with regards <laughs> to uh, things like having to take maternity leave. I think often it means that it's harder for women to access spaces of socialization in business companies. No, thank you. It is harder for them to establish connections and outside of the business world that will help them advance as well in a way that I think also hurts their ability to pursue the life goals that they're choosing that I think works against a truly full and free society. Go ahead, Drew. Okay, but you've lumped in a bunch of other social contracts under the heading of monogamy. Mm -hmm. A pressure to have children is not the same as monogamy. Monogamy is just the pressure to be in a partnership with a single individual. So Why I think... saying we have to defend that as well? Right, right. So I think, first off, all the stuff we give you about particular social roles in regards to your view in the relationship still apply. But in regards to having children, I think that norm is closely tied into a norm of monogamy insofar as when you enter into monogamous relationships, the expectation to have kids is far more easily foisted onto women when you are with a particular person onto that relationship. I don't think they're a separate as they would have you believe. The next thing I want to talk about is the second broad tenet of our criteria, which is the idea of sexual liberation. I think we need to understand a couple of things at this point. That firstly, 
Some women do not identify one person as representing the totality of what they look for in a partner. I think it's entirely possible for women to have different values in terms of who they are sexually attracted to, who they're emotionally, uh, who they emotionally connect with, and the idea that these need to be manifested in the same person. I think is an unrealistic expectation that monogamy creates. I think also in terms of sexual identity, the fact that some women may derive more pleasure and have a more fulfilling sexual life by having sex with multiple people, I think is also a facet of a sexual identity that it is wholly legitimate for a woman to have, but those dominant norms work against. So how does this connect to our criteria? Because I think when there exist dominant norms around how monogamy works in terms of shaping the sexual identity of women, just like the previous norm I talked about, it is firstly disproportionately applied to women, insofar as it is much easier for men to have sex with multiple women and not be socially ostracized than it is for women to do the same. The fact that slut shaming is a thing, the fact that women who continue to engage in these practices are viewed by their societies as somehow morally inferior to their male counterparts who do so, works against the second tenet of what full gender emancipation entails, which is when we see women as being equal participants in society as well. The second thing is even where we don't see explicit slut shaming, I think the second problem that exists is a subtle repression of your own sexuality. The idea is when women grow up in a particular society that tells them that the proper sexual behavior for a woman under monogamy is to have sex with one person and settle with one person, is that even if they're not explicitly shamed as a result of doing so, you, before entering into the age of sexual contract, repress sexual desires you may have towards other people because you think it may not be something that society will endorse. You may not, you don't think it's something that society will be accepting of either. So I think what results as a consequence is we have a section of society that has their conception of sexuality and sexual identity severely constrained by this institution and the dominant social norm of monogamy that hugely harmful living. Ultimately, we think that Full gender emancipation, insofar as it needs to entail giving women a broader conception of what their purpose and legitimate purpose in society can be, and what their sexuality can be, is harmed by the existence of a dominant social norm of monogamy that makes it less likely that women can access the purposes they seek and the sexual identities they seek for both those reasons we take to propose. My thanks to the Prime Minister for his remarks, and I'll call upon the Leader of the Opposition to open opposition's case. Here, here. I think a fundamental flaw of the way that God has conceptualized this round thus far is a conflation of the way that monogamy interacts with our society and the very gender equity that we seek and the things that actually prevent it. I think that we have to recognize that even if we're talking about a removal of this norm, we're not talking about a utopia. It would be a purposeless debate to say, like, and as soon as we do this, obviously sexism will be dead. It's about if it is preconditioned on this. So I think that insofar as we tell you we're going to continue to live in a society that has many of the same understandings of biases and patriarchy that pervades society today, we have to give a realistic conception of the way that a world without a norm of monogamy would function. But I think that they have a further burden on themselves, which is to prove not only that like, it might be preferable to have a system without monogamy, I think that's probably a different debate. The obligation of government today is to prove that it is a necessary precondition to that, uh, to that uh, uh, thing, and not something that would even necessarily like, expedite it, or something that would, uh, is like, good for it, but something that is necessary, which I think is not going to be possible within the context of this round, because these aren't the causes and sources of these problems. They are simply the channels that they are mediated through, and when you change the channels, those channels too will change based on patriarchy and those biases. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how this creates, uh, I'm going to actually paint you a picture of what I think these power, uh, these dynamics and relationships would look like, given we don't live in a feminist utopia, as much as I would like to. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how this actually manifests in the sexual satisfaction and representation of all gender identity. But first, a little bit of rebuttal. So the first thing they talk about is like, look, there's this expectation that, uh, you know, like settle down, that women are just, you know, like aren't supposed to get old uh, alone. They like, you know, are the old spinster idea as opposed to, you know, a, a man who's like a bachelor late into life. So I think that first of all, that we tell you that we agree with the POI that comes from Drew, right? That we think this is a tenuous link at best. That I think that this is something that remains. That women and the fact that they are biologically capable of having children are continued to have that expectation that they're the ones that need to reproduce. And I think that this 
is something that is actually exacerbated in a world in which monogamy is not uh, the like, status quo. Because I think this means that women are expected to even possibly have children with multiple partners and continue to be in an increasingly uh, complex web of, web of relationships that still have the same understandings of women providing children, but actually don't provide the necessary monogamous uh, status that makes it far easier for women to actually navigate and create those uh, optimal situations for their family. Uh, the, the, like, and so, uh, uh, yes, and I think that also the, the same pressures that he talks about also apply then to women being coerced in their choices in this uh, other world. I'll talk to that more in my extension. The next thing he says is like, uh, look, we have this unrealistic expectation of uh, women, you know, only have like one sexual preference. So I think recognize that we can defend that women are still able to explore sexuality because monogamy means that you are with one individual at one time. But I think that like even in a monogamous do dominated relationship, like you have exes that probably talking about you on Lulu. And I think that all of those things mean that fundamentally that you can still continue to explore the sexual preferences. But we tell you furthermore, and I'll talk a little bit more about my extension, that we think that the most meaningful sex often comes from these long-term monogamous relationships, and women are deprived of the ability to have meaningful sex when that is uh, taken away as a norm and people aren't guided towards it. So, Moving on to constructive. The thing I want to talk about first is about the power dynamics that actually would be made manifest when you talk about these relationships. Because I think that monogamy has actually some benefits, and there's a reason that we do look to it as a norm within society, and I'm like, you know, happy and proud to stand on them. So I think that, first of all, just talking about the way that monogamy allows for a power dynamic, that recognize that like, often your relationships with another individual, romantically, legally, if you wed, all of these things, are some of the close to most important uh, decisions that you'll make about your life. Where you're going to live, what kind of job you're going to work, if you're going to have children, what to spend money on. Like, these are the decisions people make with their significant others. And recognize that in a monogamous relationship, it's a one-to-one. -one. So this means that this actually requires a dialectic between those two individuals that allows them that there's no one winner. I think that we recognize that this is still flawed in that as long as patriarchy exists, there is some power imbalance towards men. But this power imbalance would also exist, uh, uh, I think, in, uh, uh, in a, po a polyamorous or uh, polygamous or whatever it may be, not... Uh, <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> non-monogamous relationship. And it's far worse because this means that now men have this ability to make it far worse. So how does this actually manifest? I think that we tell you that, different from the one-on-one, -on -one, there's kind of two ways that these relationships can play out. There's people who would be polyamorous, as in like four people on an all-in relationship together, and then people that would be non-monogamous, meaning one individual who has then multiple separate relationships with other individuals. It gets worse for women in both instances. So first, we tell you in non-poly relationships, you can't uh, like actually adjudicate for all of the obligations for individuals, and when you don't have a norm of that, that means that literally women's preferences and relationships are just thrown away if someone else that they have a relationship with takes a primary foundation there. And I think that women are always going to be the ones in the subservient position here because of the existing patriarchy norms that understand women as not being the ones whose voices are most respected or heard, or the most valuable, or uh, the ones that have control of the relationship. Yes? You can't just show there might be harms to other structures. You have to show that full gender emancipation is actually possible under this paradigm. So it's not just to say that like alternatives might also have harms. No, so I think that we're saying that this exacerbates the harms. This means that the gender equity is sufficiently slowed, and I think that actually the only burden is for God to prove that it is a necessary precondition. I think if I show you that we can like exist uh, with this norm and continue to move towards gender equity, which we do, and have full gender equity, I think that that's more than sufficient. But then the other option is that it is a uh, polygamous uh, relationship, right? So that means that you're operating with numerous individuals. We tell you because of these existing norms, they are primarily going to be men with multiple women, which creates a huge amount of time the power dynamic problems. It allows for them to play off people in the relationship off one another. They say like, well, look, like you know, you know, wife number one is like totally happy taking care of kids and staying home and you know, being more, uh, you know, like conservative and fulfilling my roles. Why can't you be like that? Rather than having it being a reasoned discussion, you can also really get out voted and recognize that the desire then to please the male within that means that women are now turned against each other and are competitive in this nature. But I think that uh, next that we talk to you about actually the way that this works in a sexual understanding, because I think that we actually have a microcosm of this motion, right, which is essentially that we have a generation that has gone more towards a hookup culture that has rejected monogamy within a certain capacity. But has this actually yielded benefits for gender equity? No, because we tell you, because you don't have the same amount of access, that often this means that people are seen as disposable and consumable because you don't have an expectation of maintaining a relationship with an individual. This means worse sex because the good sex doesn't come from like having lots of sex with random people like uh, inconsistently. We think it comes from actually having communication and an equal footing with another partner, which I think a norm of monogamy encourages because it means that those individuals are able to drive meaning and sexual 
sexual uh, sexual pleasure from one another. Like I think this conception that like uh, you need like a million partners to be sexually satisfied is actually a misguided one. In that most of the time when you care and love about another love another person and are attracted to them and dedicating to that, you actually get a much more meaningful and fulfilling understanding of your sexuality when it's crafted with a person that you trust and someone who is consistently faithful to you. For all these reasons, uh, we're very proud to those. Thanks to Leader of the Opposition for her remarks, and I call upon the Deputy Prime Minister to continue opening government's case. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, picking up where side opening opposition left off, I am sure that it is possible for a woman to gain the most amount of sexual pleasure and life pleasure from a monogamous relationship. What I don't buy is that that is true of all women, and I think that a norm ends up influencing a lot of women for which that is not true, something that we don't believe yeah. can exist when you actually try and have full gender emancipation. What I'm going to do in my speech is bring forth our final constructive. We're going to talk about people who don't actually have a full conception of who they're attracted to, of who they are, and why monogamy forces them to make that decision too early and stick with it. Then I'm going to deal with a lot of what they said in response to being and their constructive points. So first of all, let's talk about the people who don't have a full conception of who they are, because I don't think that there are people who are necessarily both sexually and emotionally attracted to one specific gender, to one specific sex. I think that that's all, often a lot of times very fluid. What I think monogamy ends up doing is saying that this relationship has to be a very long one, that you have to gain experience in a very deep kind of relationship. And at the point at which you think that that is what you have to do, you have to make those decisions a lot earlier and stay with them for a lot longer. And leaving those kinds of relationships at the point at which you find you're unsatisfied is seen as something that is not reasonable and that is not something that you ought to strive for. I think this puts in a massive amount of pressure on people who might not understand yet who they physically are. But at the point at which you understand that you're expected to be married by 25, you probably should have an idea and should start experiencing that a lot earlier on. I think that this puts a lot of constraints on individuals and on their emotional and sexual being. And the very idea that somebody can fulfill both your emotional and sexual identities. If that is the case, we are quite happy for you to be in a monogamous relationship because you find that fulfilling. But for a lot of people, that isn't true, and increasingly it's becoming more common that people speak out about that. And I'm not comfortable with those people feeling as though they're doing something wrong or not being correct in terms of their identity. I, I, undemen I fundamentally find that individuals creating their identity is the best way, and that you unfairly constrain them uh, away from that when you have a particular social norm. Let's get into some refutation now, because I want to make it very clear before I start this, that what we are proving to you on side proposition is that this is a very necessary but not sufficient means for gender emancipation. We don't have to prove that we're going to solve all of it by actually not having creating this norm. But what they do have to prove is that gender, full gender emancipation is possible with a dominant norm, which I don't think that there can actually be. They give you a lot of arguments about hookup culture, why that's been bad for women. We don't want anybody to feel as though they are unduly influenced about who they should be and how they should act. Rather, we'd ultimately like full people to actually be able to uh, uh, have their specific um, needs met. So let's deal with explicitly what they tell us. So first of all, they say, look, that a lot of these relationships have very important decisions, that there's a dialogue between the two that you can be very emotionally and sexually fulfilled by an individual within this particular type of relationship. A couple of things. First of all, I think you're probably less likely to actually have these really difficult discussions when you feel like it's expected of you that you are going to make that relationship work. I think at the point at which leaving a relationship that's monogamous is not seen as a bad thing because monogamy was never a norm or never an expectation of you to begin with. It's probably going to make it easier for women or for people who are not satisfied to leave those kinds of relationships when those questions are not being answered in the way that is best for them. Yes. We have a 50% divorce rate. We have people in non-monogamous relationships all the time. Polyamory and polygamy proliferate and these people are satisfied. Why is this norm so coercive when it actively contradicts the world we live in today? Um, because we're making it a lot easier for people to get divorces, to leave abusive relationships. We're making it a lot easier for them to feel as though it's not something that's ended up being expected of them. I think that we've made a lot of particular strides, but I think that at the point at which we want full gender emancipation, it has to be something that isn't seen as an expectation at all, something that the state doesn't like incentivize you to do because they think it's beneficial for you specifically. So then they say, look, we're talking about, uh, you have to also talk about uh, polyamorous relationships in which women are un fundamentally undermined. What we tell you is that a lot of women gain a lot of satisfaction from these relationships that we don't think is bad. Where the harms come to that, we think is a lot of social isolation that they experience by that being seen as against the norm. Existing outside of the context of the protections of the state is probably bad because if we think abusive relationships exist in any kind of relationship that you have, we want to make it easiest for women and for people who are not of uh, 
uh, for not of advantaged gender groups to actually access that means of uh, mobility among relationships. They say, look, hookup culture is necessarily bad. I don't think so. I think that for some people, hookup culture and the increase of trying to uh, reweigh the asymmetry of the kinds of expectations in relationships has been very good. That they no longer feel as though they're a slut for wanting to get uh, pleasured by a number of different individuals. For a lot of people, I think that that's just the reality, that somebody can't fulfill everything you want. Somebody might be great to raise a child with, but they're not going to be somebody that you actually want to um, have a really loving or emotional relationship with. You might have different people that fulfill different concepts. What I think monogamy does is it says that you need to have one person for the rest of your life who's going to do that. That places a lot of psychological stress on an individual also. We hear in response to this that, look, the expectations of having children, the expectations of forming different things doesn't come from marriage, that it's not, or it doesn't come from marriage or monogamy, that it's something that exists aside from that. We tell you that in monogamous relationships, it's often more incentivized insofar as like having a child is seen as best within the context of a marriage because you're in a long-term sustainable or a long-term better relationship is what people think um, that ends up being. So at the point at which you get married, they always ask you, when are you going to have kids? Because they well, see that you're going to be together for a long time more than they could conceive of somebody else. But furthermore, people I think inside of marriages are pressured into having children, but people outside of marriages are pressured away from having children. Because if you are outside of a, the confines of a monogamous relationship, I think that a lot of people end up uh, fundamentally judging you for having a child without a steady partner, for being a single parent, for not having the kind of home that somebody thinks exists because monogamy is the best particular form of system. I think that's bad quickly. Okay, but if you are a person who thinks that you don't want to have children, it's far easier for you to resist the norm of wanting to have children if you have a partner who says, together we're not going to have children, as opposed to just being on your own, thinking that okay. that happens. Okay, so you're very lucky if you have a partner that is totally fine with you not having a child. But I think that the societal expectations is that you're going to have a child and that being able to actually remove yourself from that is good. So people who find monogamy uh, very fulfilling because they have a partner who understands them and will support them is great and we're quite happy to accept that. So I want to clarify exactly what we end up standing for and why we win this debate already. I think that we show you fundamentally that this is an extremely necessary but not sufficient means of creating full gender emancipation. The reasons being, we tell you that there are undue expectations on women and of people who have not figured out their sexual and gender identity yet. That means they cannot make the best decision for them. We want to remove the norms so that people have the most independent decision of what makes them fulfilled. That they do not feel wrong for being a woman. That they do not feel that they're not doing female rights, right? I think that we create the best conception for them by protecting them, by also protecting people who do not know whether or not they're attracted to a particular individual or not. We prove to you why this is necessary. We prove to you why they cannot get full gender emancipation under their model when there are expectations against what people believe. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for remarks and I call upon the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to continue opposition's case. Here, here. here. Mr. Speaker, what they do on their side of the house is advocate for a facade of agency for individuals from oppressed groups without looking to the bedrock of the problem, which is the existing structures that allow men to still have disproportionate power, exit power from relationships as well as power within relationships that makes uh, all uh, that as relationship forms proliferate, make it even more difficult for other people as well as the government to actually criticize or critique the ways in which that manipulation is carried out. I'm going to talk about two things in this speech. I'm first going to talk about conceptions of identity and sexual agency and why they fail to show that these things are intrinsically worse in the status quo, uh, uh, in the status quo vis, uh, vis their comparative. And second of all, I want to talk about how this reduces, uh, extending with new material, reduces the capacity for others uh, within society to critique uh, manipulative circumstances. So first of all, I think government needs to show that monogamy is intrinsically opposed to equity within relationships. And they fail to do that throughout top half. They, they tell you that leaving relationships is necessarily uh, viewed badly and that people feel this norm to be married by 25. I think we can even just reflect on our personal experiences and say, how coercive is that expectation on people today? I say that by the fact that you can see that people throughout Western liberal countries are marrying much later, are, being, uh, are feeling <clears throat> compelled into those types of relationships much later in life, you can see that there is an evolution towards a, towards a society in which people don't feel that norm as, uh, as comparatively as coercive. Why is that important? 
because it shows that there is a pathway within the status quo towards uh, uh, towards more equity that it that that can exist necessarily still within a uh, a primarily monogamy monogamy based. Uh, relationship structure. We think that th th that indicates that they fail to show that this is anything intrinsic to the way that we uh, construct relationships, and that it's that it, that that is linked in any way to like uh, to, to having like polyamorous relationships or deconstructing uh, abolishing marriage as a legal construct. None of those things have happened yet, and we still see that type of progress. But we think that also, in, uh, also the idea that leaving relationships uh, is viewed badly neglects the fact that on their side of the house is just allowing uh, allowing uh, current norms to, to to then be passed with less scrutiny. So the fact so the fact is that in many cases women are left with more legal responsibility to care for children in relationships, and at the point where we have less ability to criticize uh, the way that individuals make decisions within their relationship, we say on our side of the or we say on their side of the house what is likely to happen is that more men are going to leave these relationships and leave uh, women to be single mothers without any access to, uh, to, this, to state resources for other or, or to people within their peer networks to, to problematize that. So we think that's really uh, problematic. Um, but they tell you that uh, they tell you that hookup culture does enfranchise some individuals, uh, and that it removes some uh, uh, levels of slut shaming. But I don't think that it's necessary on our side of the house to say that the converse uh, the converse of that argument is that we are necessarily committed to slut shaming. I think we can say that individuals can experiment in the short term bef uh, uh, before they before they actually commit to a uh, to a long term relationship. And in fact, getting into those long term relationships is what is what is facilitative of people's. Uh, identity because you can exp because people's uh, understandings of their own sexuality are not risk free it's not as if you can just go into relationships or, or uh, short term relationships or non monogamous relationships not knowing what your preferences are or knowing what your preferences are perfectly already we think that it's risky in those situations and you want someone who, with whom you actually have a modicum of trust but you only uh, you are more likely to have that trust with someone who you have a longer term relationship with, with someone uh, who the principle of decision making within that relationship is one of consensus, because there are only two people and you can't play one person off another person. We think that that trust is really important to experimentation that is facilitative of identity development. Uh, back back half. If two people have to make decisions about their lives together, do you not think it is actually much harder for the woman to be able to counter pre-existing gender roles as to what occupation she might go into if they have to make decisions based on the economic finances as a collective unit? Sure. So I think there are many ways that this plays out. I think the most important one is just that uh, is just that when women are in uh, so first of all when women are in uh, multiple relationships or when men are with multiple uh, women, it's easier for them to play women off of one another so that they can get the outcome that they want to hear from one individual. So it's easier for them to say that they will either leave uh, leave a relationship and not have negative consequences because leaving relationships is no longer stigmatized, or they can also just have a multiple of uh, uh, multiple relationships, so that the person who will go along with what they uh, what they want out of a partner is more easy for, uh, is easier for them to just extract from those people. So the second thing I want to look at then is how this reduces the capacity for others to critique uh, uh, um, unfair circumstances within relationships. Because when you have uh, what that what I think they promote on their side of the house is an idea of agency that just means that if I have a first order uh, uh, idea of like what I want in a relationship, that we should always uh, respect that individual's desire uh, in that case, and that no that there is no uh, way for other people to criticize what I decide for myself. But it also means that there is a proliferation of different kinds of relationships. So lots of polyamorous relationships uh, or, uh, or short-term relationships. Which means that other people within your peer networks feel as if they can't criticize your relationship on the same ground. They have to say that they feel like you are the ultimate, uh, ultimate decision maker within your relationships. And while that, while that cuts... Uh, while that does cut both ways, it's especially problematic given that we have men with vastly disproportionate uh, decision-making power in many relationships. When they have multiple relationships that are all coercive in that way, it makes it harder for, any, uh, for other people uh, who know those women to feel to empower those women to actually challenge the way that decisions are being made within those relationships. So that, that impacts things like the actual intimate relationships and the decisions that you make in terms of what you're comfortable doing with that person sexually, but it also imp impacts decisions about family planning or decisions about like the way that you want to uh, set up your finances. We think that those things are, uh, are disproportionately going to skew in favor of men who, uh, who have 
uh, who have more agency within these relationships and are viewed as the dominant partners because of uh, his, uh, their, their historical dominance. So we think that the only thing uh, uh, we we also think that the other thing that's left is that when women uh, when men feel as if they can continue to leave relationships at a disproportionate rate and leave women to, to care for children, we say that that impacts the very women that that are protected under the status quo who feel as if they uh, who do feel as if they've made a decision to actually pursue having children and feel as if that is a rewarding lifestyle for them. It becomes harder for them to see that as a viable option because they no longer feel like their relationships can actually be stable. So so for all of these reasons, very proud of both. Thanks to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I now invite the Member of Government to open the back half of the debate. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, I agree with a lot of what Jack said. I agree that men tend to be the more prominent, vocal decision makers in relationships. And I agree that the, monog the structure of monogamy means that women are often making decisions on their income, their future jobs, etc., based primarily on consideration of another person. I'm going to talk about why that structure of having two people in it, in life together, actually harms women from being able to obtain full gender emancipation. I'm going to be doing that a couple of mechanistic ways. I think first Gov did a great job of talking about why there's lots of social stigmas around monogamy that also harms women, but this is going to be looking at the specific structure of monogamy. First of all, I think it means that you make decisions together rather than on your own, and this has a couple of ramifications. First of all, because often in relationships it is one where someone asserts something that they want and another person is put in the position of making some concessions. Because while things like going off to a different country and moving somewhere or having a different job or someone with limited resources, someone needs to get a college education and someone needs to work part time in order to fund someone else going to college. These are all decisions that are made primarily based on assertion and concession. People willing to go along with it. The problem is that, as Jack recognized, men tend to be far more assertive. On Not only because they've been socially engineered to be more assertive, because men tend to be more vocal in the classroom, they raise their hand more, they participate more, they feel their opinion is more validated, but also because when it comes to realizing socially the relationships you've already seen when you were growing up as a child, it was probably in somewhat of a monogamous home where the father made more money and came home and the mother took care of their children, etc. Then it recapitulates these social tropes that people have been engineered to see. The problem is that then when it comes to that structure of that relationship and people have to make concessions, it is often that the woman will decide to work part-time so that the man can go through medical school. And the problem then being that that person has far less capital and far less weight inside the relationship when they're moving to a different country and it's much harder for them to escape the paradigm of that relationship. That but also, when it comes to the idea of emancipation, we also not only want it to be equal incomes that women and men could have, but conceivably that they're making free choices on what their preferences are. As I raised in a POI, there are some jobs where men are just considered to be more dominant inside those spheres, for example, politics and things like that. So if it comes to a, a decision where a family unit has to decide, well, which jobs would make more sense for us, it often continues to be that women choose hard to tie or jobs that will make them free at 3 p.m. so they can pick up the kids while the men have the higher workload. The reason being that it makes some level of biological sense where you have to divide time. Someone's got to pick up the kids. Someone's got to bring home a bigger salary. Who's it going to be on that deliberative atmosphere? Not only do they reproduce the social roles that they've seen before, but also it seems to make, and this is where it diverges a bit from first government too, is that it seems to make some level of biological sense. The woman has to produce the baby. She'll have to take time off maternity, so she shouldn't have the political role. Why would she run for office if she's going to make children? These are the kind of logics that reproduce themselves when people have to make decisions based on another person, when there is a binary to pick up where the other person left off. What it does end up doing is it puts women in particular roles where they make less money, where they feel less freedom, and where their lives as to where they're living, what they're doing, is conceded in part on an assertion that a man has made in that decision role. It also means that your social life and duties outside of the job are divided and dictated somewhat. That's why women often talk about the second shift, where they come home from work and then they have an extra duty, which is cooking, cleaning, etc. The reason that often reproduces itself because the man says, well, my job goes till 8 p.m., so obviously I won't be there to put dinner on the table, and you, who was made available at 3 p.m. to pick up the children, obviously ought to do it. 
The reason that matters is because it obviously stifles the amount of freedom and happiness women are experiencing on a daily basis when more of their decisions about their lives are dictated as a binary opposite to what a man has already decided. I'll take your... Okay, but we can, should, and have been changing those norms, which are different norms from monogamy. We can have things like paternity leave. We can have things like the expectation that if you have a decision-making calculus with your spouse, who might be the same gender as you and not just these heteronormative relationships you're talking about, you can decide that one of you, irrespective of your gender, is the one who's going to stay home. One of there, you is going to be the There are partner. two responses to this. First of all, that the structure of monogamy still makes it absolutely much harder to attain these ends, where there is levels like equal numbers of men and female politicians, etc., so that it could be a free choice. Like monogamy just as a structure is impeding us our ability to get to this utopian world Op wants to see. But secondly, if actually a lot of these decision-making processes are based on biology, it's actually quite hard to see how this stigma just naturally eradicates itself from people's heads. That because women will have to take maternity leave, they like have to, men can choose to. But women have to. Uh, those kind of those kind of logics will still recapitulate into those tropes. As similarly, when they talk about men and divorce, it's like, yeah, men can have children into their 70s. They can, and women, uh, the, the social trope goes that they get dried up at 40. These are things that, the like stereotypes that hurt people that derive from biology where it's not clear how they would be eradicated on the opposition bench, but in the structure of a relationship absolutely do come coercive into what kind of enjoyment people are getting and what kind of decisions they are also making. So to that end, um, I want to talk now about uh, the opposition speech. Okay, they say, look, um, monogamy allows for serious discussion between individuals on both sides. I've obviously told you why those decision-making processes are not actually good for women in a lot of cases. They tell you, look, non-polyamorous and polyamorous relationships, and here's, here's where it gets funny. They say, look, men make more pro are pro more prominent decision-makers. They're more powerful. How terrible would it be if they had multiple relationships with multiple women where they could do this? Obviously, it's to scale, where if you have a polyamorous relationship that isn't within a structure, like it's not like defining commitment, women are still making more decisions about their own lives. The idea is that because I'm not linked to this one man in the, in the present or in the future, I can go decide to work wherever I want to work. I can do whatever I want to do. So it's not just the case that because men are having more sex with more women, they're having more control over more women. It just means that women can also have more relationships with more men, and the actual power discrepancy between the actors just continues to decrease into the future. They tell you hookup culture makes people disposable and consumable. But I think it's actually an assertion about exactly what you want, which is that you can end your hookup whenever you want to, in theory. You can also explore your preferences. Often it's the case that it is an older man with a younger woman. A younger woman has had less experience and experience exposure to the social world and less idea of what they want going in, whereas the man has a better job with more capital. I also think that when it comes to the question about who is the decision maker and they come to the, uh, the decisions of adjudicating custody, it is also the case that women often in having less capital and having less of a secure job, less of a social support network, they are less comfortable leaving. All of these things change if the structure itself is not about two people being bound forever, but that women making their own autonomous ideas. Thanks to the member of government for her remarks. Now call upon the member of the opposition to open closing opposition case here, here. the dominant norm in terms of sexuality. However, we are stable, able to achieve um, other types of equality for people who are gay. That like proves the point that, point that you can, in fact, have a dominant social norm while also achieving other aims in terms of inequality. I have three points. First of all, I'm talking about like why there is a dominant social norm and like that came up from the ground up. It's not like forced down and why like that is a good norm. Secondly, I'm going to talk about like how the actual process that would take to like eradicate this norm would actually be destructive to um, the goals of further equality. Um, and thirdly, I'm going to talk about how gender equality is better achieved within the structure of monogamy. But before I get into that, I want to respond to like both the uh, 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 government teams. So coming out from the opening opposition team, get the idea that like monogamous relationships are like forced, and there's like harms to come along with it being forced. Like, 
first of all, it's like not forced upon people. She will choose to enter in these relationships, often because they like gain some sort of security from it, like they gain some other type of benefits from it, because like they like being with a person, they don't like feeling as though like other people are going to be sleeping with their partner. I think that is like entirely legitimate. Moreover, if people don't want to be in monogamous relationships, they often aren't in monogamous relationships. They often like, don't choose to get married or like they choose to have multiple different partners. Also, like she thinks that like there's abuse that happens and people are like forced into these relationships. But we can also stop people from being in abusive relationships while also preserving the norm of gender of, of monogamy. Because we're just like we recognize people get divorced and we think that's fine. Like, people should like get out of relationships that are good with them. And we can have that still norm of monogamy while people also leave relationships. Okay. They also say like monogamy is linked to the dual uh, linked to women having like, a dual responsibility. So women also being uh, like a caregiver and things like that. I'm sorry, like linked to women having to stay home but also having a job. But I think that monogamy doesn't actually reinforce that norm. It's the stereotype of women being a caregiver that actually reinforces that norm. So whether or not women are in a monogamous relationship, where they're like having relationships with like five other people, or they're having a relationship like on their self, it is still the norm that women take care of children, and that's the norm we actually have to think about eradicating, not monogamy. Really, but like monogamy is just linked to women being coerced into having children. No, it's not, because there's a biological like reason that women are just the ones that have children, so like that doesn't change on their side. Moreover, like women often have a desire to have children, and also people in polygamous relationships and in single relationships, like either like also have lots of children. So if you're entering into a different like structured relationship, you are still having children. So that doesn't change. Moreover, as Drew points out in PY, if you do not want to have a child, enter into a relationship with someone who also shares that mutual preference. And so like that's not true. So like that response to the open half. Closing half is a bit different. They talk about like how certain specific mechanisms like force women into being into these types of like bad situations that undermine their equal their equality. Like I think this is exactly the problem. Because Sarah is just like, oh well like men are the more assertive dominant ones because society tells them tells them that they have to be. Like we need to eradicate the fact that men are in fact told that they are more assertive and that they are like in these roles. Not tell women or not tell men to not enter into a monogamous relationship that they might want to be in. Like it doesn't actually uh, get rid of the get rid of the monogamy doesn't uh, get rid of those structures. But moreover, it would be more effective to actually eradicate the norm that men are more assertive within a monogamous relationship. Because if in fact women and men are splitting roles in a monogamous relationship, it confirms the fact that one gender is not more assertive than the other, and in fact, people can actually like debate about whether or not like one wants to stay home or one doesn't want to stay home based on like of like reasons of like a man can be a stay-at-home dad or because of other types of social norms that we think actually eradicate the, the reasons that women are forced to stay home. Like they're like the, the idea that they're like caregivers and like after their place in society. Um, not right now. So, okay, first of all, there is a dominant uh, social norm for a reason we think that it's good. We think that like, monogamy hasn't been like thrown upon people. We think people have chosen to enter monogamous relationships because it provides a lot of good things for them. We think it provides things like stability for them. You don't have to worry about like your partner leaving you or something else being bad, uh, something else happening that could seriously like undermine your confidence or anything else. It also provides emotional support within your choices. So like the fact that you have one partner you can talk to and you're like not worried that they can leave you actually like confirms, like, actually helps you, like, make choices, like, I want to, like, I don't want to, if I'm a woman, I don't want to stay home, or I don't want to do these things, like, the fact that you have one person who, like, emotionally is attached to you, they may be like, I respect that you don't want to do that, and then they change to act, they actually allow those women to, like, go work and things like that. We can get that from the emotional support that exists specifically within these monogamous contexts. I'll take opening. Insofar as you have conceded that norms actually incentivize people to subscribe to them, here, why here. do you actually think that there are going to be people that want to be in monogamous relationships, uh, or people who don't want to be in monogamous relationships are going to be coerced into being in uh, bad relationships? I don't think that the monogamous relationships coerces people to be in the bad relationships. I think that often people like get into bad relationships because of like other reasons. You can be in a bad relationship in a polygamous relationship, or you can be in a bad relationship if you're not in like the stereotypical marriage relationship. Like that isn't intrinsic to you being like entering from one relationship to one partner. It's usually because like some other type of power balance. I just like don't think those things are like like the, the same. So okay. So back to the idea. Like we think it's uh, like monogamy is good. Like it's come up, like, it's not been forced upon people to develop naturally, but, like, we think that there's a, there would be a significant process into, like, changing this norm that would eradicate, like, a lot of the gender goals that they want, because 
in order to change the norm, you'd have to like campaign against this like really important thing that people hold exceedingly dear to them, like marriage and like their monogamous relationships. The backlash against that like would actually undermine other types of gender equality goals that could be achieved, like things like providing more maternity leave or like eradicating the idea that men are more assertive. That takes a lot of different campaigning and other social forces you have to do. But the problem is you alienate a lot of people who would actually want to like help with those further those goals because they feel as though you're attacking something that is like intrinsic to who they are and the type of person they are. So the actual process of eradicating the norm itself would undermine the possibility of actually achieving the types of goals and the types of life, so how long it would actually take to eradicate that norm itself. So because the process of changing that norm would be so alienating in itself, we think that it actually diminishes the ability for that for that to happen. But like, how can gender equality be achieved in these structures? We can't be achieved in these structures because we think that like when you're in within the monogamous context, you can have stay-at-home dads, you can have like um, really strong maternity leave processes that basically undermine the idea that women or men fit into specific categories in those relationships, and then together they like act autonomously and make their own choices. For all these reasons, you probably uh, approach. Thanks to the member of the opposition for her remarks, and I'll call upon the government to conclude government's case here here. on the negative bench in this debate today, that sexism and patriarchal structures will still exist irrespective of whether or not the institution of monogamy is eradicated as a social norm. But I think that that misses the point of much of the constructive analysis that we've provided you on this side of the house today. What we've consistently advocated for is that these sexist structures are actually amplified by the system of monogamy that exists, and as a consequence, it is much harder to contest them when you are in a monogamous relationship. That's what we brought to you by way of extension, and all we heard were incredibly flippant mitigatory responses coming out of the member opposite. I have two questions in this debate today. First, uh, first, how do we erode or eradicate the patriarchy? And second, what expectations does marriage actually impose upon women? That's what we brought to you by way of extension and got very little engagement with coming out from the other team. So, First, let's have a look at what we get coming out of first opposition. We hear that the patriarchy will be perpetuated in the absence of monogamy. Yes, sexism will exist, Mr. Speaker, but at the point at which you have people trapped in a binary deliberative decision-making process that binds them to another, that binds them to another, that person generally being a man, that means that they are making all of those decisions with that individual based on all of the other sexist structures that would actually influence them to make those decisions. So if a man consistently has a higher paying job or has a better opportunity within society, that means that a woman is far more likely to jettison their career goals, to forgo them in the short term, such that they can make that deliberative decision with their husband. We think that that's problematic because it ultimately precludes women from seeking and ultimately achieving full gender empowerment. We hear that there is a reproductive expectation that exists on both sides of this debate. Yes, that is true, Mr. Speaker, but we think that that reproductive expectation is necessarily amplified at the point at which you are a woman and in a monogamous relationship with one other person who expects you to have a kid. The other thing as well is they completely neglect what compels people to get into these relationships at the first place. If it is true that it is a dominant social norm and women are expected to have kids, then you settle down immediately, with, perhaps with someone who is a suboptimal partner for you, and that means that you are bound into that particular relationship. We think that that's something that's problematic. We hear that there is a power dynamic and that there is a one-on-one -on -one dialectic that occurs in these kinds of relationships that cannot possibly occur in polyamorous relationships. But I think the problem is they're asserting that there should be a dominant social expectation of anything. What we say on our side of the house is that there should be no social expectation to enter into any kind of relationship. Rather, if monogamy is right for you and that's what you feel is best, you should have the ability to make that decision absent that being a dominant social norm. I never think that they engage with that in any substantive way. We also get all of these ideas about sex, that good sex comes from having one partner. Like, I don't really think that this is going to win either side of like, this debate. I think that there are plenty of people who are happy fucking lots of people, right? We think that that can happen. We think that you can have fuck buddies. But the other thing is, I actually think that this neglects 
the asymmetrical nature of many of these coercive relationships. Because if you are a young girl in a relationship, you are actually in many circumstances coerced into sexually exploitative acts by your boyfriend. Like my buddy got to second base, you should go to second base with me as well. So we actually think in those specific circumstances, this can actually be a coercive mechanism that actually further jettisons women's autonomy. Okay, so they talk about more the the notion that more autonomy exists under the status quo. We hear this from first opposition, that we are increasingly getting more autonomous structures that can enable women to participate in civil society to have good jobs. Yes, we think that that's true, but in large part can be attributed to the fact that monogamous structures are continually being eroded within society. If anything, all of that analysis falls on our side of the house. No, thank you. We finally hear the notion from both sides of the opposition bench that you are far more likely to that, that these comparative relationships are bad because other people feel like they cannot criticize your non-monogamous relationships. If anything, Mr. Speaker, I think that that is a far larger problem in monogamous relationships where people feel that it is socially taboo to criticize someone who is actually in a marriage. We also think that the problem comes when there is a massive stigma for leaving your husband. That's not necessarily something that exists if there isn't a social expectation of monogamy. Second question, what expectations does the institution of monogamy impose upon oh. women? And this is what we brought you by way of extension. I'll take it. So on uh, your side of the house, if you're in a monogamous relationship and your boyfriend wants to do something sexual and you say no, the expectation of monogamy means you might actually stay together till you do feel comfortable. But if you don't have that expectation, then it's just I'll go to someone who else who will go to second base with me. No, the, the expectation in monogamy is that you will give that person the blowjob, and if not, then they may leave you. <laughs> okay. So a few. So. Enough, because you're also bound up into the emotional relationship with that individual, so you're coerced by that as well, just to provide some explanation. Okay, so Sarah tells you a number of things by way of extension. First, she says that the, delivering, the deliberative uh, decision-making process ultimately leads to people having to make concessions within relationships. Now, I think the biggest problem out of side off the second opposition is we hear, yeah, but that's just in like sexist monogamous relationships. At the point at which they're not sexist, that means that they will actually take into consideration women's preferences. We agree, but the problem is, because of all of the sexist norms that pervade within society, because of the fact that men are generally more assertive, because of the fact that men generally have higher paying jobs than women, that means that even if you genuinely are trying to take into consideration that other person's preferences, it means that the man is likely to have a higher paying job and that the woman will have to sacrifice and take care of the kids. We think that that's problematic and is inextricably linked to the institution of monogamy as a social expectation. We, so we talked to you about the coercive atmosphere that this deliberative uh, process actually takes into account. We also told you about the binary that exists to male preferences. The fact that women often see these relationships occurring in their own home life, and then they recapitulate them over time. We get no meaningful engagement with that from the second opposition team. So what we brought to you by way of extension is that the actual institution of monogamy constrains women's preferences. It precludes them from having the ability to access things like education because of all of these sexist factors that the, both opposition teams wanted to identify in this debate. What did we get coming out of second opposition? We hear that people can get divorces and that they can actually leave these monogamous relationships. But that neglects the reason why people get into many of these relationships in the first place. They may get into them to fulfill personal or sexual preferences, but then that forces them to make other decisions about their life that constrains their ability to actually achieve eco economic autonomy and to achieve full gender equality and emancipation. We also hear that monogamy hasn't been thrown upon people, but I think that that's absurd given that it is a dominant social norm. The very definition of a dominant social norm being that it is an expectation for you to join that particular institution, so we do not think that it can be fully described as an autonomous decision. So what we have demonstrated to you on second, op on second proposition today is that this deliberative decision-making process will structurally always disadvantage women, and it is precisely because of that that we are incredibly proud to oppose the institution of monogamy. Thank you. Thank you to the government whip for the response. I call upon the opposition whip to include opposition's case as well as the debate proper. Here, here. So I think government in this space, actually before, I just want to note how cool it is that we have four teams and they're all gender equal. That's pretty rad, especially in a debate about gender equality. That's awesome. But anyways, I think government <laughs> wanted to debate this idea of heteronormative status quo monogamy as exists with all of its problems. You know, get married, have a bunch of kids, that's bad. 
Wheelop didn't want to have that debate because we would have lost that debate. <laughs> what we were telling you is, all things being equal, fighting for gender equality in other ways, ending assert male assertiveness, ending wage gaps disparity, why is monogamy the thing keeping our society from achieving gender equality? We don't, or gender emancipation. We don't think it's a thing keeping our society from gender emancipation. We think monogamy might in some ways lead to gender emancipation, and that's the stance we stood for. I'm going to criticize this debate in two ways. First, I'm going to ask how and why can we address and resolve gender's harms in our society without eliminating monogamy, and what are the benefits that we get from monogamy? And second of all, I'll say what does a gender emancipated monogamous society look like? How is that possible? Because government just can't seem to conceptualize it. But before I do that, some points of rebuttal. First of all, on the idea of sexual liberation, bless you, we think it's possible for you to have multiple partners leading up to establishing monogamous relationships. You can have exes, you can have periods where you experiment, and still have the expectation that you will settle down with a single partner. A single partner, not necessarily of the opposite gender, but of, a, of whatever gender is reflective of what you're interested in. You can still have sexual liberation, you can still have people experimenting sexually, but with that expectation of monogamy. They're not linked, government missed the mark here. Second of all, they say there's the stigma to never leave your relationship, that if the monogamy exists, you think that you can never be divorced. No! If you know what good monogamy is, if you know that there's an expectation that being in a relationship with a loving partner is something that's good, if your relationship is abusive and you don't like it, then you can say, I'm not living up to the social norm. I don't have a good relationship, and I want to get out of it. And that's why our society can step in to have things like more permissive divorce laws, to have things like more outreached women, so that they can make those choices more fairly without eliminating the idea that good monogamy can exist and does exist. And finally, we have the idea, and this is really what back half wanted to talk about entirely, is that non, like, how can we possibly have a non sexist monogamous relationship. They give us three reasons. They say men are more assertive than women. Men make more than women. Like, that you rec re recapitulate the things you learn as a child, right? And because of those things, monogamy is intrinsically bad. No! On our side of the house, we separate those issues. If men are being more assertive, give more opportunities to girls in school to speak up, reward those people. If men are making more than women, end wage gaps in those individuals. If you're recapitulating things in your society, like, present more opportunities for people to see alternate uh, uh, ways of viewing these things. Like, people don't just recapitulate what they learn. If that was the case, to paraphrase Harvey Milk, we'd have a lot more nuns running around in our society. It's just not the case that people recapitulate exactly what they learn. You can fix those things, and we are fixing those things. This side doesn't seem to recognize the fact you have more and more women in our society who are the breadwinner. You have more and more stay-at-home dads. And when these things are coupled with social changes, things like paternity leave, you preserve the idea of monogamy while eliminating those harms, and you don't have a relationship where you say, one of us needs to be the one who stays at home, and I'm the man, so it's going to be you. You say, one of us needs to stay at home, and the one goes, well, I'm more educated than you, so you're going to stay at home because I can make more money than you. That's fine. That's people making decisions as people, not as the gender norms. No thank you. How and why can we address and resolve gender norms without eliminating monogamy? First of all, note that we have no responses to Mariel's arguments about the ways in which monogamy provides goods for lots of people. It provides a sense of support, particularly if you want to deviate from social norms. If you don't want to have kids, and I'll take top half in one second, if you don't want to have kids, and your society is saying you should have kids, and you have a partner who says, I love you, and I don't want you to have kids, that's far easier, or you're homosexual, your society says you ought to be straight, but you have a partner who is of the same gender as you and says, well, I love you, and who cares what everyone else thinks? It's far more easy for you to feel comfortable in your own life when you have that person who is your rock, who is going to support you in what you're doing. That's something that they never engage with. Sure. True. Our case was not that monogam monogamy is inherently bad, but that its expression is a dominant norm forces people for whom it's not optimal to subscribe to it. Even if your legislation can be passed, this does nothing to address the harms we talk about about women and people who are uh, have fluid gender identities, exploring their sexual identities, laws I, don't fix those things. I, 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 don't, I don't think you made that link. I think you just asserted that, that was the case. I think that if you do fix those things, if you do address the other harms, then people enter into monogamous relationships in a way that's good for them. And having that as a preserved idea that you might not want to engage in dominant, like, your side just asserts that people would prefer to exist in this sort of society. Note that even <coughs> in societies where polygamy is the dominant norm, like FDL, uh, FLDS communities, most people are still in monogamous relationships. We think that to some extent, like, there are polygamous relationships, but most people still pair off with a single partner. We think people prefer to pair off with a single partner because they get benefits from that. It eliminates jealousy, like we're a very jealous species. It creates a sense of community continuity to have one person who's there caring for you, right? We think these things can still happen, and people can be allowed to deviate from the norm in some way, and we cannot like uh, criticize or crucify them for deviating with that norm and still preserve that norm. What they, we, they tell you is that things like bad relationships occur, that you have childbearing problems, you have assertive roles. We can fix these things by, by making legislative change, not just legislative change, but cultural change. We can change the idea that like a woman has to be a, a childbearer because there are like alternate ways for her to live. We can change the idea that the only that the only person in the relationship has the assertive role is the man by having the woman be the one who is the breadwinner. Within that monogamous relationship, you can have those changes in ways that mean that you eliminate the, the problem of, of, of gendered identity. You eliminate the harms of telling people that it's so wrong, but you don't necessarily like have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater and say monogamy is the cause of those ones, but it's not. It's 
related to those harms, but it's not the cause of them. Eliminating those causes means that monogamy can exist in a way that isn't going to be harmful. We have no answer as well to Mariel's argumentation about the way that the process of uh, arguing against monogamy would in many ways be harmful to other goals of gender emancipation. That attacking, and I'll take you one second, Sarah, that attacking the issues of doing these things would undermine other effects because lots of people who enter into monogamous relationships don't feel like they're in those relationships because they were coerced, because they had no choice. They feel like they're in those relationships because they have a loving partner who cares for them and supports them and provides continuity with them. Sarah. Okay. If many of the stigmas that dictate men and women's behavior in professional or social spheres are based on biology, how can you expect a monogamous relationship to not act on those principles when men and women decide the division of their labor as a body? Like, like in the way that it plays out in the actual world. Like, let's say I, I have a husband and I have a wife, and we decide that we want to have a kid. Not because, like, it's horrible and coercive, but maybe because we'd like to have a kid, because that would be fun, right? She's probably going to have to take maternity leave. Why? Because, like, a human came out of her, and, like, she needs time to recuperate, right? We can then shorten the period that she stays at home. I can say, you'll stay at home until you are physically ready to go back to work, and then I will take advantage of paternity leave, and I will stay home with her child, because I care about your career. Or she cannot have a kid because lots of people choose not to have kids and more and more people still in monogamous relationships choose those things. They're not as linked as your side thinks they have to be and we can separate those things. Which leads me to my second point of what a gender emancipated society that's monogamous looks like. We think that people can still provide, people can provide a direct and realized gender equality within those families. When you realize that you have a partner who is from a gender that traditionally has been marginalized but that person is your equal, that you make decisions with that person about your economic future and you decide what's best for you and that maybe you prefer the woman as the breadwinner, that is the actual of gender emancipation within your family unit. That is, the, and not just talking about an abstract, that is you saying, you are the woman in our monogamous relationship, and so I am going to raise our children. I am going to take on these obligations as the caregiver. Not because I'm the man or because I'm the woman, but because I'm the person who will be better at doing those things, because we decided this together as two people, not as a man and a woman, all of these other implicit assumptions that your side wants to bring into these things, right? We think you can still have these things occurring within uh, within these occurs. You can still have degrees. You can still have harms of course of sexuality would occur in like me. People would feel more safe within a monogamous relationship it happen within those monogamous relationships, and for those reasons, it's not intrinsic that we need to eliminate them. Here.